bruges ved dår, og jeg håber, I stille det er til at komme ind. Så. So. Also, last time we went through this, um, uh, we talked about smoothing, if I remember correctly. And I think we got up to here where we did this, um, we did the bootstrapping, right? Yes, we also tried the leaf on out cross validation and we tried the adaptive bandwidth where we did and then we were exactly and when we did this um, inverse variance weighting where we saw that we um, uh, that if we want to um, as our data is has Poisson noise it's better to not use, to not uh, make uh, an average over the normalized fraction, counts divided by sizes, but rather sum up the counts and divide them by the sum of the sizes. And uh, we did this here now in order to do a simple smoothing. And I think, I don't even know if I have put this here. Yes, and we used this to go back into our simple kernel smoothing here. And in the kernel smoothing, we changed our smoothing, our simple kerning smoothing uh, a method such that we calculated the weights as before, and then we took the sum of weights times counts over weights times sizes. And that gave us a new smooth plot, which is now slightly better than if we were to use the kernel smoothing uh, using the mean, the weighted mean of k over s. But still, it's not great because we see here, as we've noticed before, the simple kernel smoothing has difficulties with sharp uh, turns. And we wanted to see how we can now adapt the idea that we had before of um, doing linear, um, of doing linear regression or quadratic regression. And last time we did this by, let's go up for a moment. We had this. Um, last time she said we make a weighted sum of squares, and in this uh, weighted sum of and we try to uh, minimize this weighted sum of squares. So here we see the y position according to a regression line, and here the y position, the missing i here, of the actual data point and we take the squared residuals. Now, question to you guys, has anybody ever thought about why are we actually always minimizing the sum of squares? Yeah. Yeah, but why the squares and not the, for example, we could also minimize the some of the absolute values or something else. There might be many different ways to tell us whether the mean is in the middle. Yeah, exactly. Device. Yes, so let's have quickly put this on the, uh, on the blackboard. Uh, let's see if this uh, works better this time to make the... Yeah. So whenever we have a local regression, what we, use, what we often do is that we try to find a function f hat of y, which could in our case, this would be the, the, uh, the, the line equation, which gives us the ax plus b, so the, uh, the line, and we f of x i minus the actual value and we say we want to square this and say this should be minimized. And whenever we fit data, we typically say, let's find a function f which minimizes uh, this sum of square. And the idea behind that is that we say that the true values, that the values which we observe here, they are distributed according to this function to be found, given the xi plus a noise term, and we assume that this noise term is um, 
distributed with S0 sigma squared. Now it pays to rewrite this by saying yi is distributed according to a normal with a mean f of xi and a unknown standard deviation. And this means that if we want to find Vf, we have to solve a maximum likelihood term where we say the normal likelihood, so let's say Fn, so this is the normal density, of uh, for observing the values uh, yi given the values uh, given uh, the parameters of this, I should yeah. I should write it like this, that I say f depends on some parameters theta, so theta in our case would be slope and intercept, but it could be anything, of course. And we say, given these, parameter, uh, given these parameters theta and the x, I should be uh, maximal, and we want to make a maximum likelihood, so that means uh, we want to have the joint product of all these to be maximal. And the way how we typically would write this, instead of working on the product, we maximize the sum of all this. So we say um, we, we want to maximize over all the possible values phi, we, um, or we want to find those phi's which maximize um, this, this sum log f and y i given theta and x i. And if I now remember that the uh, normal dist arc max 1 over 2 pi sigma e to v minus Why I, uh, wait, uh, I've written this stupidly now. I wanted to write why I minus F hat X I squared over sigma squared. And yeah, I also should have said here, um, mu is the other, uh, mu is uh, the other function of sigma of the function dependent on theta of the x i sigma squared. And so this is what we wanted. Um, and now I have this thing. I take my logarithm. I ignore these prefactors here because they are all always the same. So I get argmax sum over uh, 1 over sigma squared sum over minus yi minus f theta xi squared. We 1 over sigma squared I put in front and we put this here out of the way minus n mal minus lo, n mal log uh, square root of 2 pi sigma. Yeah, exactly. Now we want to maximize the theta, so in the end we only need this part because the sigma square and the other thing isn't. And then if I now do this, morning, then we simply get uh, minus y i minus f theta x i squared. Um, always put the square on the wrong side. And this is where we get our least square criterion from. This is why in general, whenever we do a, whenever we do curve fitting, we try to minimize the sum of squares. And the reason why we minimize the sum of squares is because we say 
our fitted curve gives us the means and we assume that we actually observe values are drawn from normal distribution with the means given by the fitted curve um, and some unknown sigma. And the unknown sigma turns out to be orthogonal to the mean in the likelihood, so we can ignore it when we try to maximize our likelihood. And we see in order to maximize a normal likelihood, we have to minimize the sum of squares. This is why the least squares criterion comes, is actually meaning we normal we make a maximum likelihood uh, search for um, the uh, for uh, the parameters which gives us the, the optimal normal means for a normal distribution. Now, why do I tell you this? Because, remember, our error is not normally distributed. So this is actually not appropriate for our Poisson distributed stuff. So we should rewrite the whole thing and say, let's find, instead of... Uh, Let's redo this calculation and do our linear regression. But instead of doing this linear regression, assuming uh, that the uh, y values are given by a normal with a given mean, we say it's the y values are given by a Poisson with a given mean. So we replace this normal with a Poisson. If we have a Poisson, we can forget about the sigma squared at least for now, because in the Poisson is parameterized by only one um, parameter. And this is quite common that you want to do that, and hence it has a name. It's called generalized linear model. And the generalization comes in three points. The first point we've just mentioned, we assume that instead of a normal, uh, the data might be distributed by some uh, more or less arbitrary other uh, um, function. And uh, the other two I have written down for you here. So let's go to... Oh, where have I put them? Uh, here. So in, in a generalized linear model, we start off by saying our counts follow some distribution with a given mean. Second, we say, or let's first say third, we say the mean is caused by a linear model. And as a further way of generalization, we say that the linear model doesn't uh, predict the mean directly, but goes through a so-called link function. So we have here our linear model, and this linear model takes a uh, produces a coefficient which we call the linear predictor eta. And the linear predictor eta is coupled with the mean of the, uh, of the uh, um, presumed norm, um, probability distribution via a function which we call the link function. And you've already got reused to the thing whenever we, we always took the log and so we stick to this. So we also use here the log link. Um, in the theory of generalized linear models, uh, there's a couple of theorems which tell you that uh, the whole problem will be convex, so that optimizing our likelihood will always give the same global maximum. And this is the case if the probability distribution is pulled from the so-called exponential family. The exponential family is all those probability distributions which can be brought in a specific, rather obscure-looking form. And it includes, among others, the normal distribution, the Poisson, the gamma, the negative binomial, with respect to the mean, and a couple of uh, the binomial, uh, the Bernoulli, and a couple of more. So uh, these things are, this thing is quite common. Now, in order to get there, what I thought in order uh, to see a bit what does this difference do if we, if we go from that, I started off here with a simple example, which is outside biology. Uh, we just take something which suffers an exponential growth or exponential decay. I could have used, uh, for because we are a biology course, I should have used bacterial growth. But because I'm a physicist, I used instead of radioactive decay. But of course, you know how it works in radioactive decay. Uh, each atom has a fixed probability to decay within a given time interval delta t. 
which means that the number of atoms which decay in a given time interval is always a fixed proportion of all the atoms which are present. Hence, the change is proportional to the currently active, to the current number of atoms. Therefore, if the time derivative of, of a model is proportional to the uh, current number, then this ordinary differential equation has the exponential as a solution. And this is the reason why exponential radioactive is decay is exponential. And we usually would assume that in a radioactive decay, uh, the number T of atoms, the number of atoms present at the time T is the number of atoms present at time zero times a exponential, which I call minus kappa T with some parameter kappa, which is called the uh, decay constant. And kappa is, as you can easily see by replacing this with a two, is the same as ln two over the well-known half-life. And let's assume that we get such data. And here I have now simulated this case. You see, I take, took a time series and I take my expected counts per minutes, uh, assuming that in the beginning I have 100 uh, atoms or objects and my half-life is 20 minutes and I have as follows, hence 2 to bit minus t over 20. And so um, expected counts tells me how many counts I do expect, but the real number of counts that I observe is, of course, uh, the uh, Poisson distributed. Uh, by counts, I mean number of clicks in a Geiger counter, because that's how you do it. You put up a Geiger counter, and every time an, a radioactive decay happens, and the, and the decay product, so the alpha, beta, or gamma radiation, which comes out of the decaying material, goes towards the, gamma, uh, the Geiger counter, we get a click. And obviously, because the whole thing is stochastic, uh, we get, um, we get uh, our have a number of clicks in each minute are Poisson distributed. So uh, let's here I assume that we count every 10 minutes for one minute and then we wait another nine minutes and then we count again and these are the counts we get. And now we want to uh, fit a line to that. And the approach that you typically learn in your uh, first year undergrad practical where you measure, measure um, uh, bacterial growth is to plot the whole thing on a log-log plot and then fit a normal regression line with ordinary least squares, which is not the optimal way to do if you have few counts, because once you have few counts, the, uh, the measurement noise becomes noticeable, and therefore we should do something better. And the better thing to do is that we say, okay, we know that the counts k should follow a Poisson whose mean is given by an exponential with unknown parameters alpha and kappa, and we just want to find them. And that's what I've done here. I have written up the likelihood and then maximize them. In case you've never done a maximum likelihood fit in R, it's pretty straightforward. And what I do here is, here I write for k, you remember, is a vector of counts. T is the vector of corresponding, uh, uh, the vector of corresponding um, time points. So this is the vector of expected values. And as you can see, this of course depends on the values alpha and kappa. So this here is a likelihood function, a log likelihood function. That's why I have written LL by writing a function of alpha kappa. And I calculate for each element this Poisson and then go through this here. Now let's quickly do this in R so that you can actually see what's happening there. Now oh, come on. So I simulate my points as before. Oh, we are getting one more. Morning. So, here is our radioactive decay. And now, if I now assume some values for alpha and kappa, let's say, uh, let's take nearly the right value. Let's take 80 times 
exp uh, minus t times um, what might this be log 20 I have no clue what 20 what ln2 over 20 is but I just make a wild guess and say it's 0.1 and now you see this are the expected decay constants, which of course give me now values which I can put here and plot here and see how it works. And I want to get now a line. I want to now find values for these two, which makes this line very nice. But uh, I have to judge how much I deviate from the, ex the uh, observed values deviate from the expected thing according to the expected amount of Poisson noise. So what I do is I uh, ask what is the probability of observing the actual counts k if I have these things and now I get here my probabilities and I can already say with log equals true give me the logarithms of the probabilities just as a side note this is nearly the same as if I would have written uh, this with a log in front so it is actually the same values, but this is more performant because it uses a formula where the log is already in. Otherwise, it exponentiates and logarithmizes again, which is a waste of time. And it, that is a waste of time is relevant because we will now do this often. I take a, I sum all this up, and now I get my total log likelihood, and I want to find the minimum value for this log likelihood. And what I do for this is I write this as a function. I say this is the first function argument and this is the second function argument. And then I use the general purpose optimizer function of R, which is called optim. And it wants a second argument, the function to be optimized over. And as a first argument, it wants uh, an initial guess. And for the initial guess, I just use the guess that I've just used, 80 and 0.1. And what it will then do is that it always calls this here with that. And the important thing I have to do, the optim function is a minimizer, but I want to do maximize the likelihood, so let's put a minus here. And if I now mm. run this, as you can see, after a short moment, it gives me here the parameters, 100 as we put in, and 0 0.0345. Let's see if this is the correct thing, log 2 over 20. 0.345, perfect. Yes, so Optim has a couple of different optimizers. Here, the Nelda Mead, the BFGS, the CG, and so on. To quickly go through them, the most important difference between optimizers, uh, so first of all, these are all local minimizers, i.e. they find the minimum which is closest to the initial value by gradient descent. If we have to find, if we fall into a local minimum, we might have to go over a wall in order to get to the proper global minimum. These things are not appropriate when we have to use global minimizers like simulated annealing or genetic algorithms and so on. But for local things, we have to, we do essentially a gradient descent. So the primitive thing would be to calculate the gradient and go inwards. For to do this, we need the gradient. And hence, what I can now do is pass this thing a gradient as a second function by manually calculate the gradient of this function and write it there. Manually calculating the gradient is, of course, always error prone. This is why I don't, at don't attempt to do it now while you're watching. Uh, but uh, if you want to get a fast result, having the gradient is crucial because otherwise it would have to write to get the gradient by numerical differentiation, so it does a step into each coordinate direction. Here we have only two coordinates because we have two parameters, but if you optimize over a hundred dimensional function, calculating the gradient manual takes ages. Uh, Venel, all for these gradient descent algorithms, there's a couple of different uh, um, uh, approaches. The classical of all of them is called conjugate gradient which is like a normal gradient descent, but it does some rescaling of different axes in some clever way to reach the minimum faster. The uh, Boltman, Fletcher, Goldfarb, Srifa algorithm, which is a variant of a conjugate gradient, which tries to do the whole thing more efficient. 
and the LBFGSB, which works especially well if your L stands for limited memory, which stems from the time when computers were still running on uh, um, core memory with uh, where, hundred, where one kilobyte was a huge investment, and hence the memory was uh, optimized to not always keep storing the whole gradient. Instead, it stores only a small part of the gradient. Uh, that was the aim of optimizing BFGS for limited memory. We still use the LBFGS algorithm because it achieves this by is using only part of a gradient by, uh, sorry, the gradient we can always directly calculate because all these here, these three here, they expect that you have a gradient, but they try to get the Hessian, the matrix of second derivatives. And while, and the trick is because the Hessian can of course be quite large if you optimize over 100 parameter function when uh, your Hessian is 100 squared and you want to uh, recalculate all these 10,000 parameters in every step. So there's ways of asking what do you actually have to recalculate and this is, uh, and they, these three things differ in how they do that. And the LBAFGS is especially clever in recalculating only a small part. So it's basically the fastest linear gradient based optimizer. If you don't have a gradient, you can calculate the gradient numerically, but there's something else called the Nelda Mead algorithm, which tries to avoid calculating the gradient altogether. What instead it does is it uses a simplex. So for those who don't know, a simplex is the is a uh, n-dimensional um, no, uh, generalization of a triangle. In 2D you have a triangle, in 3D you have a tetraeder, and in, uh, in n uh, dimension you have an n-simplex. So it starts off with an n-simplex and then always tries to optimize whether the gradient is within the n-simplex or not. So if you have a um, if, for example, this would be your, your uh, profile and your simplex, your current simplex is a triangle like that, the thing would notice that this corner is much lower than the other two corners. And when it will do some clever flipping of the one which is, let's rather make it like this, of flipping this one over on that side, and it always does, a prop, does one of three steps, either flipping the thing or shrinking it. Uh, I've forgotten what the third step was. In this way, this, uh, this triangle gets, tries to get over the, get the minimum in its inside and then shrinks around it. Uh, so all these algorithms stem from the 60s, so they are really old, uh, but they were great, and this is why we're still using. The last one, SAND simulated annealing, is a global optimizer. And Brent is actually a line search algorithm for 1D problems. So I don't know what that one's doing here. Anyway, so this is what I wanted to show you here. With the, optim with the general purpose optimizer, we can quickly find these things. Here with my, here my options and so on. And, but general purpose optimizers are general, but they are slow because they are not optimized for this thing. For example, in a linear model, as we've just seen, we can consider a linear model also as an optimization problem. We want to minimize the sum of squares, and we could simply say, find all the coefficients better by using these, these general optimizers, but that's not what we're doing. Instead, we're using specific algorithms for linear models, namely uh, Gaussian elimination, or its numerics version with QR decomposition. Um, and the same holds here. We can use the fact that the whole thing is similar to a linear model uh, to do this. So we define the generalized linear model. As I've just said, we have a distribution out of this, uh, out of this uh, exponential family. We have our linked function, and we say the linear predictor depends on the model parameter in a linear way. So these are our model parameters and the connection between uh, uh, between the linear predictor and the uh, data values is that the, uh, that the model parameters feed, uh, better are linear coefficients in the linear combinations. We may want to offer an extra parameter O here, which is constant and which is just given for each one, just saying for every element in, for every data point after you have predicted the linear predictor, add this value OI. 
This value is often called the exposure parameter. Why that? If uh, you have a look at our original example here, where we have our, uh, our decay, I said I, every 10 minutes I count the clicks in my Geiger counter for one minute. What if I decided that here towards the end, when I have few clicks, I don't count for one minute, but for two or three minutes to collect more clicks. But here, because I'm lazy, I only count for one minute. So I expose the Geiger counter for different lengths of time to the data. Hence, I have differing exposure. And if you now think about it, how does this exposure go into our model? Obviously, if I wait twice as long, then I should multiply here this value by two. If I pull it up here, I should add the logarithm of the length of time that I added here in order to fix for my differences in exposure. So this is why these O's are often called the exposure values, uh, especially important in when you work with something like cancer uh, data, where you want to know what's the probability of something getting cancer, asking how many years he has worked with asbestos. This is why it's called exposure, because usually you talk the standard textbook example where this is needed is uh, how many years does a sub was a subject exposed to a certain dangerous condition. So, and uh, the way how we now calculate our thing is we, instead of using the general purpose optimizer that I used here, I can also use the linear model function, but I have to fit a G in front to switch to generalized linear model and say again, my linear model is simply that K depends on T because that's my model here. Eta is intercept plus slope mile times time. So my sum here is only to one thing. And, my, and I have to tell it what kind of of probability distribution it has, and the GLM function comes with a set of family functions. Uh, this, is, so this is a distribution family, and this here we call the Poisson family, and there's this function which informs it about everything. If you actually uh, look at what this Poisson family does, Poisson, uh, you see it returns some magic object and inside this magic object is actually a list of 12 things, namely the things which it actually needs to calculate it, the link function, the inverse of the link function. So if you would look into this with the log, with the exponential, a variance function which tells us how the variance depends on the predicted mean. So this is just the identity and uh, interestingly enough, what's not in there is the actual distribution function because we don't need it. And that's the funny fact about generalized linear models because what this GLM function here, you see what it does. I call it here, the link equals log I can omit because this is the so-called canonical link, so it's the default. And when I get back uh, the same intercept as I got before, 92, uh, uh, what have I done wrong here? Ah, the intercept here, the slope is the same as before, 3, 4, 2, 3, 4, 2, this time with the minus, and the intercept, of course, I have to exponentiate it because it gave me the intercept inside the exp and not outside, and then I get 92.38, which is the same as I have here. What the GLM function does internally in order to speed up things and need less iterations in order to converge, is what's called uh, iteratively reweighted least squares. So for each iterat iteration, it does a weighted least square, the same as we've done a weighted least square for our, uh, for our um, kernels moving before. But the weights are now taken from the variances. So for each data point, I calculate what's the variance that I expect at this data point? And as you can see here, the variance here will be higher than the variance here because here the variance is, uh, because, the, uh, um, because the, this Poisson has a higher variance of that Poisson. Um, so uh, what it does, it uses the linear predictor, compares it with, uh, with our observed data and tries to reduce the square of the residuals, but on the log space, and it, 
and uh, it weights each, um, each residual square with uh, the inverse variance, also as we've done before. But this weighting with inverse variance uh, has one issue. What if the observed count was zero? When the, inverse vari when the variance is also zero and the inverse variance would be infinite. The trick that GLMs does is in order to calculate the variance, it doesn't take the y value, we observed y, but it takes the predicted y hat. So it runs the thing once with standard weights, maybe all the weights the same, and it gets predicted value for each y. And when it, these predicted values, they are of course never zero. And when it uses this to predict the variances, and using these predicted variances, uh, this predicted expression, it predicts what variance the count would have if the expected mean were correct, and uses this to calculate the weight and reruns it and iterates this until convergence. And you can prove that this always converges to, win, uh, to the proper minimum. And this proof is the heart of this whole GLM theory. Um, here now, uh, I mean here, yeah. Here in our the radioactive decay problem, we used the log because only that makes the model linear. Remember, this is our this is our model, and we need to push this thing through a lock in order to get a, a linear predictor. And that's the crucial part. We want to get to a linear predictor. Now what happens often in practice, however, is especially statisticians, very much to the annoyance to people, uh, to physicists, statisticians have a habit of choosing a link function simply based on what gives me the right domain. And in statistics textbook, you often read, well, we, have, we fit on the log scale because then we don't have to bother with negative values. Uh, not a good uh, thing. As we said in, in biology, my argument is always we use the log function because we use the logarithm because the mass action law acts on products and we want to work with sums. So now how do we do this to come back to our kernels moving? So I now want, you remember last time I made myself here this uh, smooth kernel and I want to make, uh, I wanted to add noise and now I want to have counts. So what I'll do is I exponentiate this function, uh, this one here in order to get rates for my Poisson because you see this value becomes negative, and now I do exactly the stupid thing, just exponentiate so, it has, so that everything is positive. Also because I constructed the function so that after exponentiating it gives something nice. And was I here? So I now want to make an example of a Poisson noise. So what I do is I take my function that I had before, I shift it a little bit to get nice values, so that was just trial and error on my right, but after exponentiation I get fractions. And you see here my, our example gene here at the peak, it makes up something like uh, several percent of all the transcripts, and at the bottom it's less than a thousandth of a transcript. Now I also need a realistic distribution of total counts, and for that uh, I simply take here a a um, log normal distribution and say this should be my distribution of total counts. So I draw from this here uh, values around them so that my total counts are integers. Then I draw from this true function here, uh, sorry, no, I draw um, t values from here uniformly distributed, where have I made my draw, my draw from the, ah, here. I, here I have my pseudo time values x, I draw them uniformly from zero to one, and now for each thing, for each element I have, for each cell I have one x value, I have one size factor, and I have one expected mean fraction according to this curve. And now I use this to simulate my Poisson, u times s, 
and I plot this. And in order to be able to plot it again, I have to uh, divide it by S add my, and add my pseudo count. And we see again why this pseudo count is stupid because it gives us here this big gap. And you can now see again why this big gap is an issue if you were to use our normal smoothing as we've done before. With the normal smoothing, if I were to replace this 10 to the minus to the 4 with 10 to the 5, then this gap gets larger and otherwise it gets smaller. So this, this value here influences how much the zeros are able to pull the fitted curve down. And we don't want that this strength of how much it gets pulled down is followed by some arbitrary uh, scaling factor that I put here. This is why we now use the scaling factor only for the purpose of fitting uh, the data, for the purpose of plotting the data, while in our calculations we don't want to see any scaling factors. And what we instead want to see is do smoothing. And my first attempt to do the smoothing is to use again the simple kernel average, where we, uh, where we do what we did before, we just count k over s, and we get this, what we've already seen, with the inverse variance weighting. And now we switch to the generalized models. And for the generalized models, I can again do our local regression. You remember how our local regression worked? We go to every little point here and say the fitted curve at this point is obtained by taking only the values in the neighborhood, weighting these values with a weight, and um, and moving the way and uh, fitting a regression line or maybe even a parabola and taking only the value in the middle. So I use the same as we've done before. I calculate in order to get the value x naught around a given position here. I calculate the weight around this x naught according to my tree cube kernel. I fit my linear model, and this time I simply say GLM instead of LM. Tell it my uh, model, the counts is, depends on the pseudo time x, and because I wanted to fit a parabola also on its square. I take the weights from my tree cube, and this is now new, I also add an offset variable, that's this O's, this exposure that we had before, which is log S, and of course I tell it that I want a Poisson distribution. And when, after I get the fit, I take out the coefficients and take, of course, the intercept plus x times the, the first beta plus x squared times the other beta. Instead of writing this explicit, I also could have used the fitted value function, which does the same. And now I run this for each value in my grid of x points, and uh, it gives me some uh, it gives me some warnings, but I ignore them for now. And now I plot here this, and we see the blue one is the real curve, and the red one is our fitted curve. And we see that the fitted curve does a very good job of following the the exact shape of this top here. Only here it gets a bit into trouble, but this is understandable because you see there is much more serious here than here. That was, of course, coincidence, but uh, can't be helped. Uh, or it could be helped by switching over to a adaptive bandwidth, so that maybe here we get a bit more than here. But overall, this is what we now do. And this is where my notebook stops. And... Now, last time, I suggested a homework where uh, you could try to fit such a curve for a couple of different um, for a couple of different uh, uh, genes in order to uh, to see how different genes uh, vary along pseudo time. I haven't done my homework, but has any of you? Let's assume that uh, the the, the those who aren't here have done it, and if we now listen to this recording, they say, of course I've done it, and I'll show it next time. Uh, yes, I think, uh, do you have a nice heat map by any chance, Philip? <laughs> yes, well, we have to, uh, okay. So, 
these are different genes, and you can see which genes go up and down. Uh, yes. The bin stuff, like not too fast, um, like, like the yeah. Stuff. Exactly. But here you see this was sort of the kind of uh, thing I meant. One thing I was realizing, uh, actually, uh, we're, not, we're too few today to ask, but who actually needs a grade on this course? Because we have different possibilities. We can either make some oral examination or we can say, you work out one such homework question nicely and then you put a grade on that. But let's think about this then. Uh, the next. So, uh, because all the others who might need a grade don't know that. So the next thing I wanted to talk about today besides this is about PCA. And we, whenever we did this uh, initial, whenever we processed our single cell data, the PCA was always our uh, first step and after we log normalized the data. And the question is a bit, why is this so helpful? And also, what does a PCA do internally? And I thought, I, uh, what I want to show you today is two things. First, how does a PCA work? In, or second, how does a PCA work? And first, why does it help us? And before we get to that, let's have some intuition. And the whole intuition behind is that we imagine that, uh, the, uh, that there is something which we call state space and something we call feature space. Uh, so feature space is each cell, as we've seen, is described by a vector of log normalized counts. And these vectors live in something in a vector space, which we call the feature space. And we call it the feature space because it's spanned by measurable uh, quantities, which we call the features. But we know that uh, many of these features are highly correlated. And this is because the states, because uh, the cells probably or seem to live in a much lower dimensional manifold, which is somehow embedded in this feature space. And one way how to understand this is that we imagine that in order to fully describe the state of a cell, whatever we mean by state, but it's total biochemical complement, we might be able to specify some vector, and this vector has, lives in a space with an intrinsic dimension, which is maybe 20 or 30 dimensional. And one, one issue which we get into here is if I talk about uh, describing the state of a cell, I should probably distinguish between a relevant and irrelevant state degrees of freedom. Because uh, if I want to describe a cell completely, of course I have to tell you about every single RNA molecule, how many of them there are there, and so on. But on the other hand, maybe this doesn't change so much. So my imagination of a feature space is made it look something like this, that, um, that maybe there's a manifold in this feature space where all the cells sit here and if we progress on this cell in this direction, this has a lot of, uh, this has a lot of uh, effect on how the cell functions biochemically. And if we change in this direction, the cell cannot move much uh, without it becoming unphysical. And, um, and the di this direction doesn't matter. We might imagine that this direction the longitudinal direction tells us something important about the cell, whether it reacts to stimulus or not. And this direction is that given this position on the x direction, where, where is some optimal value for something like how much, pop, how many uh, molecules I need of this specific uh, cell. And if it's a little bit, if it's one more or one less, it's still fine. But if it's five more or five less, we are outside the viable area of a cell, and the cell wants to stay close to that part. So in a sense, this direction doesn't work. Now, if I have something like this, the question is, what's the dimensionality of this thing? Is this a one or a two-dimensional thing that I've drawn here? 
And in a certain way, you might say it is two dimensional because it has two directions. But in this direction, we have orders of magnitude more extent than in that direction. So if I step back a bit, it becomes one dimensional. Uh, you, if you want to, you can formalize such aspects by using uh, this uh, box counting dimensions, which people use who work with fractal geometry, who then like to say, if you make boxes to, uh, you might know who remembers how a Lebesgue measure is, uh, is defined. Uh, but roughly, if you want to, if you have a space and you want to define its volume, one way you can do is to set a grid over the space to make, to count this volume in squares or boxes or hyperboxes in space. We have more of them and you count how many boxes are, uh, how many boxes are, uh, overlap with this thing. So here my, I have my there and might say these boxes, they all overlap. And then I make the boxes smaller and the grid finer and finer and just count how much uh, is overlapped with this. And in a one dimensional object, what you will find is if I make the grid half as, uh, as twice as fine, then the number of overlap boxes will double. But in a two dimensional object, if I make the grid twice as fine, the number of covered uh, squares will quadruple. So if I have an object like this, what I will notice is if I start with a rather coarse grained grid and make it finer and finer, then first the number of overlap boxes will scale linearly and at some point it changes and scales quadratically. So we can say at the scale up to this change point, uh, with the uh, manifold is one dimensional, and once we get finer than that, it's two dimensional. And that's a useful way of thinking about such things, that on coarse graining you can leave dimensions, which is just a fancy way of pointing out what everybody knows. If I give, show you a piece of paper, everybody would say this is two dimensional. If I then say, yeah, but notice it has a finite thickness, when you say, oh, course, it's three dimensional, but it didn't mean that. And the same issue we have here with the state space. But of course, the state space has at least the same dimensionality as the, uh, as the feature space, because when we change only one count of only one molecule, the state of the cells changes subtly. But in practice, this is one of these changes in this direction, which doesn't matter. And the feature space, which matters the dimensionality at a sufficient cross graining that within one of my boxes, the cell doesn't change too much, doesn't change noticeably in its biological function. We can say it's essentially in the same state. On this scale, this feature space is probably, this state space has probably much fewer dimensions than the feature space. Which means that there is a function from state space to feature space, which goes from a low dimensional to a high dimensional state. And we, what we ideally would like to do now is to, in order to understand a feature space, to find the state space. And ideally, if we now were to be able to uh, find, um, let's put it that way, if we imagine that all the states, we, all the cell states which happen in our sample or which could happen in our sample, they give us a probability distribution in feature space. And the support of this probability distribution should be something like a, a manifold with a complicated shape. And it should be possible to find a map or an atlas on this thing. And let's imagine it's an atlas with only one map. Then this map would give us the intrinsic low dimensional uh, feature space dimension. And so ideally, if this, if this would be in feature space, we have something like this when we should be able to find a map which maps this on 1D along this part. Uh, in practice, uh, and we do our PCA a little bit in the hope to do that. Now, of course, what I've drawn here is precisely what a PCA cannot do because a PCA is a linear operation and I'm hoping to find a nonlinear map. But nevertheless, even uh, even uh, with a linear operation, we should lose many uh, feature, many dimensions. 
uh, because uh, if if a state space is a man if this manifold in state space has a certain low dimension we can still ask can we embed it in a euclidean space of some higher dimension and is this euclidean space we need to embed our manifold might still have much fewer dimensions than the number of genes and this is what we try to find in the with our pca and yeah and sometimes it's it helps to to think back about that this was sort of a mathematical motivation some people call in bioinformatics call it the manifold hypothesis where they say spaces live on a manifold uh, of course the term manifold hypothesis also implies you know not every subspace is a manifold we don't want any kinches or kinks or discontinuous stuff and this is actually something important to discuss whether this is really realistic to say that everything is continuous because sometimes cells divide and that's something that we certainly cannot uh, uh, cannot map as a continuous trajectory on state space already because it branches but still it uh, makes our life easy to at least try to find the subspace of a feature space that is as small as possible, but still big enough to embed uh, the state space manifold when it's somehow mapped over into feature space. So now I want to show you what actually uh, the PCA does in um, recent files. Ah, yeah, it, it, what the PCA actually does. And to do this, what I will do is I construct some simulated data and I, I became, and in order to make my simulated data, I started off uh, by just making three strangely strange probability distribution. You see, I took a normal, a gamma, and a, uh, a, and a normal mixture with two components to get this here. And I just now imagine that each cell is constructed by drawing from each of these densities one value. In this way, I get a three-dimensional state vector. And that one I will now map into the feature vector. I later realized that this wasn't the best idea to simulate. Uh, but for now, it will be useful. And we'll later talk about why actually the simulation is not a very realistic uh, simplification of a cell space. But it is useful to explain PCA. So what I've done next is that I said, okay, I imagine my cell has a three-dimensional cell state space and a seven-dimensional feature space. So I have my mini cell has seven genes, and the first gene is produced by depends with, a, with depends strongly on the first state variable, a little bit on the second state variable, and not at all in the third one. And the second gene depends strongly on the second variable. And as you can see, sometimes they depend, uh, they depend in a positive manner, and sometimes they depend in the opposite way. And in order to calculate now my features, what I would get is simply I take my uh, three state space variables and multiply it with this matrix to get the feature values. So that's what I've done here. Here, first, this matrix shown in picture in case it looks nicer, but probably doesn't give us anything more. And now what I now do is I take, take this, uh, this latent space. Yeah. So here, latent are for each of my simulated thousand cells, its three state variables. And latent loadings are the influence of each state variable on each of the seven genes. And if I multiply them, then I get uh, then I get my features. And in order to make the whole thing not so simple, I add an IID nose to this to these seven things, and now I get this data. And of course, if I don't add the noise, so why not is without noise? Why is with noise? If I don't add the not the noise when I'm still in, three di in a three-dimensional subspace. And I can see this immediately by asking what's the rank of the matrix Y0. The matrix Y0 is a matrix of seven columns and thousand rows, but its matrix rank is still only three because this 
because each of the seven columns is a linear is, is a different linear combination of the same three Latin vectors. But once I've added the noise, I lose this three dimensionality and I'm back at seven dimensions. But again, this is a bit a situation of what we have here. Let's say this would be our feature space and this would be our subspace, the three dimensional space. And now I add noise. And again, the noise blows this only a little bit up. And if we make enough steps back, we should recover that actually it's just an extra thick piece of two dimensional paper and not a real three dimensional thing. And this is what our PCA tries to reconstruct. And as we will see, the PCA is able to reconstruct it even though the amount of noise I put onto it is quite strong. That's 1.5. This is uh, much, this is about the same order as Y0 itself. So if you look here at Y0 and we look at the column bars, apply Y0, comma, 2, comma, SD, you see the standard deviation uh, each feature varies from cell to cell with a standard deviation somewhere around one and a half to three, and I add one and a half of noise, so this is an, a decent amount of noise. So, uh, of course, I've added, uh, I've added normal noise instead of Poisson noise this time. Um, we will later talk about how much changes if it's Poisson noise. So. What do we try to do in the PCA? We try to go back to this, and I've written this down for you to see this again. So we have a data matrix, an n times k data matrix y, where each row describes one of n observations, and by observation or statistical unit, I mean a cell, and the three and the columns are the uh, features, so the things which we uh, observe about each observation and we span the piece of feature space. And uh, now we first always make a preparation which makes our math easier. We centralize the data. So that means from each column we subtract the mean. So that the mean of each feature is zero. I've always put a little C to remind me that the matrix is centered so that its columns have mean zero. Obviously, this is, we don't lose generality with, with this because we can just subtract the means store them somewhere, and in the end, when we're finished with everything, we add them back. But when they are centralized, we can now imagine this now makes us easier, because if I centralize this thing, I put the origin of my coordinate system here, and now I can simply say, I try to find a line through the origin, which goes through this data, and I only have to find the direction of the line and not its offset. That's why I do that. And what I now want to do is I want to rotate the coordinate system. So you see my initial coordinate system is here parallel to the uh, directions of a blackboard, and I want to find a new coordinate system where one axis like this and the other is orthogonal to that, such that the edge mass as possible of the data lies in as few as possible of the coordinates. So we try to find a rotation. And a rotation is described by a matrix. Who remembers what makes a matrix a rotation matrix? A. Why does it have to be orthonormal to make a rotation? A matrix conveys a linear... Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so a matrix or the other way, remember that and if, we con if we understand a matrix as a linear operator which transforms a vector, each column of a matrix gives us the image of the unit uh, of the basis vector. So the first column tells us what the first basis vector will be transformed to and so on. If we have a rotation, that means our coordinate system, which is made up by unit vectors which are orthogonal to each other, that this orthonormal basis should be transformed to another orthonormal basis under rotation. And this, of course, implies that the images of the orthonormal basis vectors should again be orthonormal, and this is why the columns have to be orthonormal. How do I check that a matrix has orthonormal columns? I multiply each column with every other column. If I multiply the column with itself, it should be one, 
if, it multi if I multiply it with another column, it should be zero. Um, important, I can carry out this easily by multiplying the matrix with its transpose, because A transposed times A does exactly this. It, because usually a matrix by matrix is the columns of the rows of the first matrix times the columns of the second, but if you transpose the first matrix, you multiply each column by each other column and put this into the matrix. And then, so a rotation matrix is identified by the fact that RT times R is the unit matrix or the identity matrix. And that's what we use here. So our objective is to find a rotation, that means a matrix of R dagger R is one, that transforms all our vectors in a new basis, and such that uh, and as such that we have uh, that uh, we have as much possibility along these. So if we calculate the variance along the first coordinate, we want to maximize this variance. Because as you see here in my image, if I take the coordinates, if we take the coordinates of all data points along this first rotated basis vector, I get maximum variance. And that's how I want to find this thing. Uh, the other way which we, how we can understand PCA is by saying once we invert the PCA, we want to get maximal reconstruction. So let's try this quickly by saying we take now our data vector and run it through a principal component analysis. And afterwards, the precomp function of R gives us back this thing. Here, the rotation matrix, which is called rot. Here, the rotated data matrix X. Here, uh, the standard deviations of the individual X values, which should now be maximal in some way. And here, because it has centered our data matrix, it subtracted the means. Here, the centers. Let's check that it really does this. So let's first center our matrix by subtracting the color means. So here is now my centered matrix, and each column has mean zero. You can see this here. And in fact, this is also what's written here in PCA dollar center are these means that it has subtracted beforehand. Uh, of course, if you rotate a centered matrix, the new matrix will also be centered. So the color means of my rotated matrix X are also zero. Um, important request is we want the PCA to give us uh, not, only not only orthogonal columns in the rotation matrix, but also orthogonal columns in the rotated matrix X. And this is indeed the case. If I multiply the, each column of X with every other column of X, I see here that each column is orthogonal to every other column. And what you see here in the diagonal, these are the, uh, these are, uh, the uh, variances. Why are these diagonals the variances of x? It's easy to see. If I multiply xt with x and look at the diagonal element, they are, of course, uh, these, the, uh, um, the norm squares of a column, so of column J multiplied with column J, so the scalar product of column J with itself. So we have to add, so we have to go over all the cells I and add this up. Usually for a sample variance, we would subtract from this the mean, but we've just seen the means are zero. So this is why these elements are the same as the sample variance of the columns. I show this here to make sure that this is really the case. I first take here the, the diagonal of this thing and subtract it through my usual Bessel factor, n minus 1, get these values. I look at the variances of the columns of x, get the same values. And I look at these s def values, square it, and I also get the same. So we see that this is all this thing. And they are, uh, they are ordered in decreased values. So we see from top to bottom, uh, we, uh, really the first principal component has picked up the most variance, that one a bit less, and so on. We can, uh, an important thing that we look into a bit more is the total variance of all the, what has happened now? Uh, 
the total variance of all the uh, x squared and of the y squared has not changed, but now it has changed, and I don't understand why. But I had this error before, and I was I somehow messed up uh, something about my stuff here last time. Uh, don't ask me why. Yes, last time these two were the same. I, I keep having mistakes here about this centering, and I have re-added the center there. Aha, uh -huh. I have to use the centered Y for this to work uh, when it works. I, we come back to this later anyway. So, the important thing is we said that X emerges from the data matrix Y by rotating over this rotation matrix R. Let's check that. Here you see uh, the centered matrix YC, and here I undo the rotation by rotating the data matrix X back from, PC, from the PCA basis into the standard basis. And as you can see, we get the same values. Uh, this means that we can reconstruct the original data by taking our PCA data, rotating it back, and adding back the centers. It only works if you get your little T's right, and that cost me an hour uh, when I prepared this, uh, but yeah. And of course, we haven't checked yet that the rotation matrix is really a rotation matrix, but RTR is this thing. Now let's have a closer look at here, this reconstruction. Um, what I do here is the following. First, I want to show here this thing, which is called the scree plot which is simply the plot of the standard deviations of the columns of the x-axis. And this you can see, again, as we've already said, the first component uh, captures most of the data, the second a bit less, and the last four components have rather small standard deviation. In fact, this standard deviation is just the noise that we added in the end, and these are the real noise that we have before. And as we... And... Uh, so we see here that these first three components have substantial magnitude, and these have, well, it still looks substantial, that is because when I rerun the code, I kept playing here with how much noise I add. If I reduce the number of noise I add here, then this goes down. You can play a bit with this. If I reduce the number of noise I add at the beginning, when I, when I add IID noise to each feature and I add little noise, when this here sits very much at the bottom and I have a feeling all the information is in the first three and then comes here the rest. See if I can quickly show this to you by uh, going here and saying instead of 1.5, I only add 0.5 and go back to the scree plot. And now you see uh, these things are very much at the bottom. So, um, another thing I can do is that I take the cumulative plot, so I calculate how much variance I have if I use only this, if I add up the variances that I've just had here, and I see how this thing here goes up until I get here to the total variance of this yc squared. And now what, I, uh, what I'm heading at is the reconstruction. I try to reconstruct my data as I've done it here, but I reconstruct it only using these first three components. So here is, here is the reconstruction for using the full data, and as you see, I reconstruct the data perfectly. I get back to my original data Y if I undo the rotation and re-add the centers. But if, and the mean squared error of this reconstruction is zero. But what happens if I don't use the whole matrix, but only the first three columns? those which have here substantial standard deviation. And if I do this, as you can see, we now get a reconstruction error. And we can now ask, how does this reconstruction error depend on how many columns you use? So as you can see here, I use here this, I first say, what happens if I only use the first column, the first two, the first three columns, and so on. And as you see, with zero columns, so only using the centers and nothing else, I, of course, have a, have 
full reconstruction error. Each component I add brings the reconstruction error down until here uh, we don't have any reconstruction error left. And importantly, this curve is exactly the uh, mirror of this curve here, where I just took the accumulation of the standard deviations of the x-axis and added them up. Which shows you that saying I want to have as much uh, standard deviation, as, as much variance as possible in the leftmost columns of x is the same as saying I want to have optimal reconstruction uh, of the data by using only the leftmost columns. Um, so, and I can say in a way that these first three columns of a rotation matrix, they span this Latin space where all the data sits in, and the other four, they span the orthogonal space where only the noise sits. And the reason why uh, this is interesting, so it's rather to make sure that the rest of my data, of my uh, stuff works again, I add now here a, I switch this back to 1.5 so that I have a lot of noise. And uh, I can now use this to, uh, uh, to calculate distances. So what I've done here is, so we have here our rotation vector. So these are the basis vectors of, this, of the space in which the, feature, the state space is embedded. And the other four are the space orthogonal to it. And here in the low, and here we can compare this again to the loadings. And let's now project this first loading vector. So you remember this was the, this was the, the way how I constructed my data. I said, I, called for each cell, I drew three random variables, and then I constructed my seven genes by, draw, by multiplying with them. And so, of course, each of the seven genes is somehow spanned by this. And if I now do, uh, to check this here, what I now do is I project each of these three loading vectors onto the basis spanned by these three principal components. So I calculate the projection, by a projection the, the vector m onto the basis and multiplying with the basis vector. Remember the r's, the basis vector of the rotations, they are of for normal. And then I get here now the projection calculated into this, and this is now my projected uh, vector, my projected loading vector, and let's compare it with the original loading vector, and as you can see, it's nearly the same. I can look at the differences, so the difference between the projected vector and the original loading vector uh, on the scale of the thing, and notice it has changed only by 0.002. So if this was the basis, if this is, is the basis, and this was our loading vector, here the difference is only less than a percent of the whole thing. Which means our three, our PCA has has a reliably reconstructed this space that I put into the dimension. I put in these three latent loadings, they spanned the space, and I recovered the space. What, however, I haven't recovered is the correct identification. I cannot identify the first component with the first loading, the second component with the second loading, because this might be rotated against each other. Sometimes I can, if one loading has much higher standard deviations than the others, then the corresponding PC will also have much higher. But if the loadings have similar uh, standard deviation or similar variance, then they will, he will intermix. Difference, okay. So, and here, this is the case for all three loading vectors. They all are very well, uh, they all are basically within the the PCA space spanned by the first three principal components. We don't have to, if we project into it, we hardly lose anything. So it was in there already. We can already check, we can now uh, check the correlation between the basis vectors and the loading vectors to see uh, something like this. So here we see our principal components. And as you can see, the first principal component aligns quite well with the third loading vector, while the second and the third one, they seem to be a bit intermixed. 
between latent factor 1, 2 and PC2, 3. Uh, the remaining PCs, uh, they still have some correlation, but there are hardly any covariance because uh, they have so, so little variance. Now, the reason why we did the PCA was we want to understand how similar cells are in feature space. And in order to do this, we should look here at this, uh, we should try some distance reconstruction. So I now here decide, take here two samples. So I, I sample random pairs of cells, this cell and that cell. And I calculate the distance from every cell to every other cell. And I can calculate it with distance by taking the originally noisy data here. I can also calculate it by using the PCA data. And I can compare them. And notice that, uh, what have I done here? That uh, they are quite uh, similar. Actually, they are exactly similar because after all, this here is the full PCA space and that's just a rotation from the Y space and if I rotate bases, my distances between pairs of points shouldn't change. So this is why this aligns perfectly. But what if I now uh, go down to only the first three components? Then I now see that the scatter plot shows these deviations. And of course, the distances is now higher. First, they were exactly the same, and now I see some deviation. But with feature space data, it contained measurement noise. And because we simulated, we still have the data before we added the noise. And so I can also calculate the noiseless feature space distance. And now I can again make a plot where I first compare the noiseless feature space distance uh, with the full PCA and then with the truncated PCA. And unfortunately here, the distance doesn't, the difference doesn't look that strong, but if we calculate the mean squared error, we notice that the mean squared error went down quite a lot. So uh, here the variance in cross section is only half as much. More importantly, you see here sort of a, some socket of a minimum noise, which is always present, which is simply the distance, which is caused by adding up the noise and this vanishes here and we reach, actually, we are able to discover where two cells are really similar, which we weren't able to do before. I have a better space afterwards which shows you, uh, which shows you this much stronger by using more realistic data and then we see a dramatic difference between these two plots instead of the other thing. But before we go there, we have to understand what PCA is actually doing. And so, so far, we've just talked about, um, we've just used this PRILCOM function, but we have never looked at what's happening inside. And uh, it's quickly said what the PCA function does internally is it does, uh, it takes the data matrix and turns the data matrix in the so-called covariance matrix, YTY. Why is this called the covariance matrix? So first of all, I would say before I've always written a little C to say the data matrix is uh, centered. I got tired by this. Uh, now my data matrix is uh, centered, is always centered no matter whether I say T or not. And we'll have a little look at this now. Before, but before I make a quick, get a quick uh, picture of my what's okay can erase it so Oop. Oop. right here that and this And scanner, here it is. So. Okay. Let's get some 
space. So before I start, two notational uh, things. First notational thing, there will be no C whenever I write Y, it's centered. And second notational thing, uh, whenever you work with matrices and vectors, you have this annoying issue that you never know whether the vector, if I say Y, I, is this the i row or the i column of Y. I will solve this issue by using a uh, fixed notation here, where I say, whenever I say I, it goes over the observations. So if I say Y I, this is a vector describing one observation, i.e. one row. I use J for genes, so the columns of Y. I use L for principal components and S for the eigenvectors that will appear any moment. So first, uh, what is the covariance of two features um, why at yt, why now I have to say, do it correctly? I want the covariance between features, I think. I hope this now works out all right. So I, I have, I said, I are the observations and J are the genes. Let's see if it works. So let's say we have a vector for one feature and another feature, and we want to know their covariance. Accordingly, this, for, to do this, we have to sum over all observations and have to multiply yij, yij prime. Uh, actually, usually, I would have to, for this to be a covariance, I would have to say this is this minus um, minus the average and minus the other average. But luckily, uh, our uh, data is centered. So the average over all the, uh, we know that yij averaged over the um, observations i is zero. Yes. Uh, I put it in front here. Now I get this thing. So this stuff here uh, can be removed because it's just the um, cover. It's um, There was an error in the webcam. Why is this now? Uh, now it works again. So, okay. So we can, we can simply say the covariance because our data is centered is yij, yij prime summing over all the i's, and that is uh, yt, y. Or is the element j, j prime of yt, y, as you can see, because this is just a matrix multiplication, and for this to be a matrix multiplication, I have to transpose this. Uh, this is why we call this matrix YTY, -Y, the covariance matrix of the data, because, well, each element of it tells us the covariance of two features. And of this, what we will now see in a moment is if I do an eigen decomposition of this thing, it will tell me uh, the PCA, which is, of course, a bit surprising. Maybe Pearson was quite proud of himself when he figured this out. And uh, we'll see how we do this now. So, 
The way how, uh, let's first see whether this really is what's happening. So I take this YTY, so transposed of the center data matrix times transposed, calculate the eigen decomposition. And now, as you uh, see, is um, I get here my data, I get eigenvectors, and the eigenvectors are exactly the same as the rotation matrix that our PCA has given us, except for the fact that sometimes the signs are the other way around. Here in the fourth, for example, it starts plus, plus, minus, 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 and the other is minus, minus, plus, plus, plus. So we might, the two matrices are identical up to the fact that the signs might change. This is normal because an eigenvector is only defined up to a sign because if u is an eigenvector, minus u is also an eigenvector. Hence, the sign is undefined and can swap between these two information. The other thing that our eigen decomposition gives us is the eigenvalues. And these eigenvalues are actually, as you can see here, the same as the standard deviation squared times, uh, of course, we have here the same issue as we have here because we calculated on the covariance matrix and the covariance matrix is n minus one times the stuff. We don't get really the covariances, so this factor is, will always appear somewhere. But apart from that, sometimes the factor is in and out. You see here the column sums of the P rotated PCA columns and the eigenvalues are the same. And the question is now, how is, why is this? And here I've written this for you. Let's see if I now manage to do this by saying the way how I can understand a basis rotation is that I can say any feature yi. So notice my logic. This is a row because it has, has a column. This was a column because j is a column index. It's a feature. This is now a row because it has an i. And obviously, the way how I can understand and I is write this vector is I say this is a sum over all the j's, yij, with ej, which is just the, um, which is just uh, the uh, basis, the standard basis vector, so the vector with all zeros and the one in j. But because we know that uh, yi, is also um, because we know that yi is also uh, uh, comes out of a rotation, is, uh, gets rotated to become xi, our basis thing. We can also write it as um, in the rotated basis. The rotated basis vectors are the columns of the vector R and the columns of the vector R, I use L, and of course the matrix X contains our coefficients I, L. So these are the two basis expansions of our data vector for one element. And um, what I can now do is I want to understand this PCA space rotation. And I've done this here by saying I can split this up into two parts, which I say this is, let's say I want to reconstruct my Y from the PCA space only using the first K basis vectors. So I use this, and then I have the L is K plus one till M, X, I, L, R, L. So I just split the sum into two parts and I say this here is the reconstructed basis and this is the remainder. So the reconstruction and the, the reconstruction of X using, of, uh, the reconstruction of Y using only the first K components and this let's call it delta Y, I, this is our reconstruction error. Now we can already see what we had before, namely that uh, why there is a different why uh, there is this parallelity between adding up the um, between maximizing the variance and minimizing the um, 
and minimizing the uh, uh, reconstruction error. Because as you can see, these RLs here, they are orthonormal basis vectors. So these two vectors, they are orthogonal to each other. So we can say that uh, the sum of yi, that the norm of, uh, of yi squared is the norm of this thing squared plus the norm of that thing squared. And this norm here is, of course, easy to see. That's L is 1 to K is XIL squared. And this here is also XIL squared, but using the remaining uh, components. K plus 1 till M. And here in front, this is YI j squared going over all features. So with, if you now imagine and um, what we can now also do is that we say, okay, this is now the reconstruction error for one feature. Here's the reconstruction and here's the error and here's the original length. If I sum this over all the features, I have now an i, here I have an i and here I have an i. When you see here, this thing here is just the sum over all the squared elements of a data matrix. We call this the Frobenius norm of the data matrix. Frobenius norm is just take all the matrix elements, square them, add them up, take the square root. And this here, the whole thing, is the Frobenius norm of the matrix X. So the Frobenius norm stays the same. So we can now understand our variance optimization as uh, the Frobenius norm, because if you now look at this here, one way how you can also write it is by look, saying this goes now from L is 1 to K, X L is K plus 1 to M. So here, so notice what we've done. We've started with a with the norm of the of uh, of of the reconstructed part for one um, data element. We written it in the PCA basis. When we said let's sum up over all the observations i, and what we now see here can also be seen as the sum of the squared norms of the columns of x. Everybody sees that. Here I have now written the columns of x. And each of these elements is a norm of a column of x. And in order to get a reconstruction error which works, to get a low reconstruction error, we have to put as much as possible of this, of this total Frobenius norm of my, in my data. So this here is the total Frobenius norm of my data squared. And I want to put all as much of this total Frobenius norm I want to put into the left-hand columns of X. So that little of them is left for the right-hand columns because the left-hand column, and this has two effects. First, what we see here, that's the column variances of X, which we said we want to maximize in the PCA. And these here is the column variances of a reconstruction area for of the principal components we don't use, which we want to make to minimize. So, and coming with this logic, we may now ask, uh, how should we choose these basis vectors R such that uh, we maximize this part? And to do that, we do the following. We want to now show that the eigen decomposition helps here. So, and let's start with first the first column of R. So let's ask. 
what could we chose choose for R1, so the first column of uh, first column mm, of R to uh, maximize the norm of the first column of X. To see this first notice, because we have um, because we have X is RTY, I hope I haven't messed up the T's. Each element of each column of R makes one column of X. So for example, so X I L is sum over all the um, R I J Y I J. Have I done this correct? Yes. So this is how this depends. So we see that X1 only depends on R1 and X2 only on R2 because uh, here it says I L. And so this means we have to now ask what is the, the R I L to optimize this? So we want to maximize X I L. or uh, x i1 squared summed up over all the i's. And for this, we want to maximize um, sum over i r i l r i1 y i j squared squared. And to do this now, and now we can ask, what should we put in to maximize this? And to do this, we expand R I in the eigenbasis of Y T Y. So we've done an eigenvalue decomposition of Y T Y. So we've said that Y T Y is U lambda U dagger or UT. Everybody remembers how eigen decomposition works, right? Uh, we have here a symmetric matrix because it's symmetric, it has an eigen decomposition. So there exists an orthonormal matrix U such which turns this matrix diagonal. And this means a lambda contains the eigenvalues and the columns of U are the eigenvectors. So I want to expand R1 now in this eigenbasis. So what I do is I have here US and these are the eigenvectors of YTY and I put in front some coefficient, let's call it row 1S. And what I now want to find is the optimal rows in order to maximize this. So I put this in here, I and S, Y, I, J squared, and now comes with R, I, one squared is, uh, ah, now I have to cheat and look how I've written this up here. Where I've put this x i l x one squared. Yep. So I put this here. Yes, here we go. So we want to see this x one squared, and as you can see here, ah, this is how it is. We wish to maximize this the norm of the first component of x in order to put as much state as much uh, variance as possible in there. And to do this, what I now do is I write this x1 squared as 
So I want to maximize this thing here. And what I now do is I write this here as x1 tx1, which is just the scalar product written differently. Now I write x1 as um, y r1, because here this can be written as x1 is y r1. So I write x1 as y r1 and x1 t as r1 t y t. And now I expand here r1 in this eigenbasis. So I have r1 t is expanded in this eigenbasis s and here R1 T then becomes rho 1 S U S. And here I have rho 1 S prime U S prime. And I sum over S and S prime. And here in the middle I have Y T Y. And now I'm running out of space, so I go on down here. And now it becomes easy. We can we see that Y T Y rho 1 S. Y T Y U S is of course Y T Y U S is T Y U S is because it's an I U S is an eigenvector. This is the corresponding eigenvalue lambda s. So we get here now rho one s rho one s prime. When this here gives us lambda s u s, when our lambda s, and when u s prime u s, obviously this here is orthogonal, so we get, uh, so uh, this here gives zero if the s and s prime is not the same, so I can simplify my double sum to a single sum, and now I have here rho 1 s squared lambda s. And remember, our whole point was we wanted to optimize these row. We wanted to make this thing as big as possible because this here is our first x. And how do we make this as big as possible? Uh, we've forgotten to point out that, of course, these row 1s squared, if I sum them up over all the s, it should give 1. Um, because we wanted to, we expanded the, um, uh, the vectors of the rotation matrix R, and the rotation matrix, of course, has of has uh, unit length vectors. So this has to be one. So we cannot make all of these arbitrary large. We have to decide how do we split up this one onto the different components here to make this as big as possible. And now, once you look at this, it's pretty obvious. You have to put all the weight, the full one, onto the biggest lambda and forget all the other lambdas. Therefore, our optimal first rotation vector is uh, the first eigenvector of y t y. Once you've done this, you can say, okay, now I need a second vector of, of r. The second vector of r should be orthonormal to the first vector of r. So I cannot put anything into the first component, so I have to put everything uh, into the second biggest eigenvalue, and so on. So, my computer is running out of thing. I'm running out of ideas. I've written all this, uh, I've written down for you here uh, my argument that I've just made in a bit of uh, detail, which shows you how this happens that it's the eigenvector, the, that it's the eigenvalues, uh, sorry, that it's the eigenvectors of a covariance matrix that give you the optimal rotation in order to maximize variance and minimize your reconstruction error. And uh, those of you who have done any kind of mechanics and uh, have to remember the principal axis theorem and the inertial tensor, uh, 
uh, right, was sort of what people thought a lot about in 19th century mechanics and what people got onto the idea of this. But this is sort of one of the quintessential uh, applications of, um, of eigen decomposition. Because what we are really doing here, in a way you can understand it as, we take some random vector v, and if we now, uh, and we can consider this variance-covariance matrix as a quadratic form, which takes a vector v and tells us how much variance we, re we uh, retain if we project everything onto this vector v, as you see here. Because we take this vector v, here is a transpose missing vt, yt, yv, tells us how much variance we retain if we projected our whole data on v. And we want to ask what vectors v uh, maximize the skew. And once we've maximized it, what is the next vector of v? And exactly this question, given a quadratic form, find the vector which maximizes the quadratic form and then find the next vector which is orthogonal to the previous vector and is maximizing this is exactly the generalized formulation of what an eigenvalue problem is about. And this is why uh, this quadratic form is what gives us this, uh, what connects the eigen decomposition with the task of a PCA. And uh, the first time this whole kind of logic uh, turned up in science was when people uh, looked at the um, Look at the inertial tensor and zero gravity t, t handle and realized that this strange thing is going to happen once somebody. So, this is 19th century physics, but it took until the, uh, until the ISS up, uh, up there to do something. If you've stu ever studied theoretical mechanics, then you know exactly what this has to do with our PCA. If you haven't, then it doesn't, but it still look, looks pretty. <laughs> and this is sort of a demonstration of a so-called inertial tensor. But uh, because I only have one minute left, and I now won't tell you this crash course in physics, and just leave it as this little picture here. Okay, then we meet again in a week, right?